All right, I think we're about ready to uh, to get started here. Everyone, welcome to the first installment of the Emerald Choral Academy. I am Gary Cannon, Artistic Director of the Emerald Ensemble, a professional choir based in Seattle. The Emerald Choral Academy is a series of webinars during which our area's leading professional choristers will reveal their personal tricks of the trade to community singers. These webinars will then be made available freely to singers across the world via the internet. The Emerald Ensemble is very grateful to our generous donors who have made this project possible, particularly the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. We encourage anyone participating or viewing this webinar to make a donation as you are able at emeraldensemble.org. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our mailing list to hear about future sessions of the Academy and the other activities of the Emerald Ensemble. I've posted links in the chat format um, uh, off to the right. You click the chat at the bottom and it'll open up a window to your right. Is that to your right where you're looking? Uh, uh, and you can see those links that are there. Uh, this webinar is being recorded by participating you are granting the Emerald Ensemble permission to share your contribution. Please ensure that your microphones and cameras are turned off for the duration of the presentation. You can ask questions to the presenter by typing into that chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Periodically, I'll interject to field your questions. Uh, there will also be a designated question and answer period at the end of the presentation. We thank you for your patience, as this is new technology to, for us. Uh, there are bound to be a few more bumps and bruises along the way. Two days ago, and again this morning, you received confirmation emails that included a PDF handout. You may wish to access that now. There's also, again, a link to the handout in the chat window. Also, today's presenter has suggested that you might benefit from having a mirror nearby. However, that will work. Uh, this session's instructor is soprano Holly Boaz. Holly is active in opera, oratorio, and chamber ensembles with particular affinity for the Baroque era. In fact, she is my go-to soprano soloist for Handel's Messiah. She sings it as if it were written for her. It's astonishing. Uh, Holly also teaches privately in the Tacoma area uh, and on Vashon Island and at Pacific Lutheran University and at Tacoma Community College. Her topic today is Vocal Anatomy 101. It is a great personal pleasure to introduce to you my friend and colleague Holly Boaz. Thank you, Gary. That was very kind. And thank you so much for asking me to be a part of this. I think it's a wonderful idea that you've had, um, Gary and Scott, to get us together in community and keep us learning and keep our minds active and keep our voices active. So I will dive right in. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if this all works. Hopefully, fingers crossed. All right, does that look right, Gary? Okay. So as Gary mentioned, this is Vocal Anatomy 101, and it is definitely going to be very much an overview. There are many details that I will leave out or gloss over, and I will um, make some minor generalizations as we go through. So I, I recommend to everyone who wants to learn more about a particular aspect of this presentation, see the uh, list of recommendations that are included on your PDF handout. And of course, come to our next anatomy-themed Emerald Choral Academy session. So why do we study vocal anatomy? And do you need to know the minutia of vocal anatomy in order to sing well or even in order to teach well? And I would say, no, you don't. But the more we understand about this instrument, the more we can overcome limitations, fine-tune performance, build stamina, maintain vocal health. You know, usually when a person learns a new instrument, such as a clarinet or a guitar, uh, the first thing we do is map that instrument, name the parts, and figure out what all those parts do. And we don't often do that with singers, which is very interesting. 
So let's take a look at this human instrument. Uh-oh, there we go. Okay, so we have four main components of our instrument, as many instruments do. The first being our power source. Then there is the vibratory source, the thing that moves in order to create the complex sound waves by moving the air. And then we have the resonator, the space in which those complex sound waves can bounce around uh, that then eventually reach our ears as pitch and timbre. And uniquely to the human voice, we also have the articulators. I'm not gonna spend very much time on the articulators today. I'm gonna spend our time on the power source, the vibratory source, and the resonator. So let's start out by looking at the power source. And as you probably all guessed, the power source of our instrument is our breath, or the air that moves through the instrument. And we share the same power source with many other instruments. Wouldn't it be cool if we could actually breathe fire while we're singing, like Lizzo can do through her flute? I haven't figured that one out yet, but if anybody does, let me know. So today, while we talk about the breath, I'm going to cover mostly the muscles in I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the structure, and I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the physics or the overall body alignment. So that's something you'll have to come back for the next session of the Emerald Coral Academy Anatomy um, 102 to hear more about. So let's look at what a regular at rest breath cycle looks like. This is an overview of the basic physiological process of breathing, which I'm sure you're all complete experts at breath cycle. When the body is ready to take a breath, the airway opens up, the rib cage opens and lifts to expand the volume in the thoracic cavity, the diaphragm contracts and descends, and air rushes into our lungs. And when we're at rest, this is a passive breathing cycle, when we're ready to exhale, the opposite happens. The chest collapses and gets smaller, the diaphragm relaxes and ascends, thereby making the thoracic cavity smaller and air rushes out of the lungs and out of the body. Let's look at the main muscles involved with this process and, and we're gonna start with the inhalation muscles. The primary muscles of inhalation are, as you probably know, the diaphragm, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a moment, and the external intercostals. And the external intercostals are the muscles that go between your ribs. The secondary muscles of inhalation or inspiration include the sternocleidomastoid muscles. We have one on each side that go from our mastoid process by our ears across the neck and they attach to the sternum. And underneath those are a set of three scalenes. Let's explore the diaphragm first. Oops, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna play this 3D animation of the diaphragm. Ooh, maybe. Here we go. <laughs> okay, and while you're watching this, notice how high it sits in the body. The diaphragm sits fairly high. It is definitely above our abdominal wall. It attaches to the lowest part of our ribs on the inside and then to the inside of our lumbar spine in the back, as you can see these muscle fibers here that come down and attach to the lumbar spine. When the diaphragm is relaxed, it sits at its highest position just underneath our lungs. There are some holes in the diaphragm to allow the esophagus and the arteries and the nerves to pass between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. It's an involuntary muscle. It moves whether we want it to move or not, which is great because we want to breathe while we're unconscious. And we have a pretty poor kinesthetic sense of our diaphragm. It's difficult for us to discern how the diaphragm is moving, um, where it is. We don't really feel it per se. We feel the things around it moving more. The diaphragm is active or engaged when we are inhaling. It contracts and descends when we inhale. It is relaxed when we exhale. 
The full excursion of the diaphragm is about three to five centimeters, but it can increase to seven to eight mm. centimeters, depending on the size of the body involved and also the range of motion. And there are things we can do to increase that range of motion. You can mimic the movement of your diaphragm at home. If you lace your fingers together and place your hands in front of your chest, for those of us who wear bras, the base of your thumb is going to go about where your bra strap does. So it's quite high. You can also find the, the bottom of your sternum. That would be the bottom of the diaphragm. And as you inhale, your hand will descend. And as you exhale, your hand will relax back up again. So you can practice that motion at home to mimic the movement of your diaphragm. Let's look at the other muscles involved in inhalation for a moment. So we're going to focus on the left side of this image and even on the left side of this muscly torso that we're looking at here. So we see the outline of the diaphragm. And remember, the diaphragm contracts upon inhalation. So when we inhale, the diaphragm descends, which helps the bottom of the rib cage open up. And when we exhale, it ascends. Here's that other group of primary breathing muscles, the external intercostals. They connect one rib to the other, and when they contract, they open and lift the ribs, allowing for larger volume inside the thoracic cavity and air wants to come into our lungs. Here are those secondary or accessory muscles of breathing, the big one being the sternocleidomastoid and the small ones underneath, the three scalenes. As singers, it maybe is uh, wise to avoid using those secondary muscles of breathing if possible. They are associated with what I call the stress breath. Their job is to lift the rib cage up to the head and they're really helpful when we do things like running or um, very vigorous activity where our muscles need a lot more oxygen fast. And when we're singing, if we overuse them, we, two things could happen. We could build chronic neck tension, which we kind of want to avoid. And we can keep ourselves in that stress breath pattern, in that state of anxiety that's associated with our sympathetic nervous system or our fight, flight, freeze mode. So the more you can activate these primary muscles of inhalation and relax the secondary muscles of inhalation, the easier and freer your breath will be. Okay, let's talk about those exhalations now. When exhaling at rest, it's pretty passive. We don't really need to do anything. The exhale will happen on its own, and that has to do with physics, which we'll talk about in another session. But when we're speaking or singing and we want to provide resistance to that air, or we want to control the speed of the airflow, we do activate some muscles. And we'll take a look at what those muscles are. This time we're going to look at the right side of this muscly torso. I should have named this muscly torso. I'll have to do that for my next talk. The first ones we'll notice are the intercostals, this time the internal intercostals, which are the agonist-antagonist pair that matches up with the external intercostals. So the external intercostals are the ones that raise and lift the ribs. The internal intercostals lower the ribs and pull them back together. So that's one of our muscles of exhalation. And then we go to the abdominal wall. The innermost muscle, which you can barely see here in this little cutout, is the transverse abdominis. And for any of you who lived through the 80s, I am a child of the 80s myself, you can think of those giant elastic belts that we used to wear on the outside of our clothing. That's sort of what the transverse abdominis looks like, but it's on the inside. It's the innermost layer of that abdominal wall. Then we have the internal and external obliques, which go diagonally and they help us in our twisting motions. And then the most superficial is the rectus abdominis. The fibers for that go up and down, connecting the rib cage to the pelvis. And this would be what you call your six pack abs. Okay, so before we move on and before I take some questions, this was like such a fast overview of all the mu muscles involved in breathing. I want you to think about the fact that the diaphragm is engaged when we inhale, but it's not engaged when we exhale. So think back to all those lovely, well-meaning 
choral directors and voice teachers from your past who've said things like, use your diaphragm, sing from your diaphragm, engage your diaphragm. <laughs> and, and those aren't bad thoughts, but do you see now how maybe some of those ideas are problematic because the diaphragm is actually relaxed while we're exhaling and while we're singing, we're exhaling. So I'll leave you with that thought and some of these lovely thoughts on this slide. And I'll pause for a moment and ask Gary if there are any questions. I don't see any questions there yet. Uh, are you hearing me all right as I'm responding? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, I don't see any questions yet coming up. Um, I, I would uh, ask though about the, so there's different layers of muscles near the, the ribs. How do they connect with each other? Uh, do they influence each other's movement? Yes. Are you talking in particular about the intercostal muscles, the internal and external? Uh, everything that leads up to my six pack abs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so mostly the abdominal wall then. So the, the job of the abdominal wall is mostly to provide stability for us between the structure of our rib cage and the structure of our pelvis. We have all of this area between those two um, very uh, protective structural parts of us that is exposed, right? We don't have our skeleton in our abdomen so much. And so those muscles together, layer upon layer, give us that... Um, firm protection, <laughs> some of us further than the, firmer than others, um, around that abdominal cavity so that we can remain stable even though we don't have the, the skeletal structure between our ribs and our pelvis other than our spine. Um, the abdominals are, those muscles connect two parts of the rib cage and two parts of the pelvis. So I hope that answers your question, Gary, but let me- Fantastic. Okay. That was fantastic. Uh, and no one has typed anything else uh, in, in the interim, so, uh, so feel free to keep going. <laughs> okay, I'll leave you with one thought about the breathing part of our um, exploration here, and that is that um, I did one group of agonist-antagonist muscles, right? We have the external intercostals and the internal intercostals, and they do the opposite thing, just like our bicep and tricep. But it's often the case that we're engaging both sets of muscles to some degree. And this is where we get into this very tricky thing called breath support or breath management, right? Which is taught in a variety of ways. So I'm not gonna open that can of worms so much. But I will just say that usually when you're working to control the speed and pressure and flow of your air on an exhale, you are engaging some of the muscles of inhalation and some of the muscles of exhalation at the same time. So there's a give and take involved there and those muscles work together. Okay, I'm gonna move right on now. Let's see. Oh, we do have one question that's popped up and now's probably a good time for it. Sorry that, um, uh, which is about the rib cage. Often it's said that the rib cage is expanding if you're breathing correctly. Uh, what exactly does, does that mean? How do, how do we understand that? Yes, good question. I love that question. So when we engage our internal intercostal muscles, their job is to open and lift the ribs. At the same time, hopefully our diaphragm is also contracting and its job is to descend. And as it descends, the bottom part of that muscle kind of pooches out to the side and allows the bottom of the ribs to open up. What that does is it actually does increase the volume inside of our thoracic cavity. So if you think that when the diaphragm is released and at its highest position, we have a bigger volume in our abdominal cavity, but when it descends into the space of our abdominal cavity, it then creates more space within our rib cage. I hope that made sense. This then has to do with some physics, which I'll get into in another session. But basically, we lower the pressure on gases inside our thoracic cavity, inside our lungs, by expanding the volume of the rib cage. And those are the two main mechanisms to do that. Activating the internal, I mean, sorry, activating the external intercostals to lift, and then activating the diaphragm to descend, thereby widening the bottom of the ribs. I hope that helped. 
That, that, that made good sense to me. It does occur to me though, uh, again, in, in the spirit of we're still learning the technology, that it's possible the participants are still only seeing the shared screen and not seeing your hand gestures. Oh dear, okay, I don't know how to fix that, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you can unshare or re uh, stop sharing and then reshare um, if, if so inclined. Okay, perhaps I should do that going forward if I have something full of hand gestures. Oh, I, I see there, though, that you are appearing at the top of the screen even while you're screen sharing. So re remove my, my, my comment there. Oh, good. Okay, good. So Thank you. Seeing enough of you. That, uh, uh, that, that's what matters. Uh, one final question, and then we'll, we'll let you proceed, is how do we engage the muscles in our back while we're breathing? So the external intercostal muscles go all the way around. So there will be some of those muscles around towards the back of your rib cage. And the best exercise that I give my students that seems to help with this, and you can do this in two orientations um, in regard to gravity. I would start by lying on the floor with your back on the floor and your feet on the floor so that your knees are bent, right? Make sure that your lumbar spine is comfortable. And then as you breathe, specifically breathe in a way that you are focusing your awareness on the feeling in the back ribs. And you can use the floor as a means to press into you. You'll get some good feedback from your nerves and your back because you're pressing into the floor. When that starts to feel consistent and you're really noticing where that muscle activity is when you're doing it in such a way as you really feel that contact on the floor, then I would recommend going to a flat wall, trying it in a sort of chair pose where again, your knees are rather bent you're finding a comfortable position with your back flag against the wall, and then you can breathe into the wall that way so that gravity is pulling on you in a different way. Good question. All right, Gary, if there aren't any more, I'm gonna jump ahead. Go for it. Here we go. This is my favorite part, you guys. <laughs> the vibratory source of our instrument. So we talked about our power source. Now this is the part of our instrument that vibrates and moves air particles around that compress and rarefact and create these complex sound waves that do all the fancy phys physics things that I don't understand, but eventually get to our ears and sound like pitch and timbre. So in a clarinet or an oboe, those would be the reeds, right? Or strings in a string instrument. But in our instrument, it's the vocal folds or vocal cords, you can say either one, either one is completely acceptable. And our vocal folds are found inside the layer rinks. Sometimes I hear folks say layer nicks, but think about ice rink, layer rink. There you go. Here is where the larynx is located. And this is from a great website that you guys should check out called voicescienceworks.org. If you're geeky like me and you love body stuff, this is a great website. These little black arrows point to where our little tiny vocal folds come together to make sound while we speak and sing. And here's a side view so you can locate where they are and you can all palpate your larynx. When you're talking, you can feel the vibrations in your fingers. And when you're swallowing, you can feel the larynx move up and down. Let's see, let me catch up over here. So in this section, instead of focusing on the muscles, I'm mostly going to focus on the structure, but I will mention a couple of muscles as we go along. So let's look at this structure. The larynx is a flexible structure made up of muscles, ligaments, and cartilages, and one very special bone. And that bone is up here. This is called the hyoid bone. And it's special because it's not directly attached to any other part of our skeleton, but it hangs from the skeletal structure. So it's very movable. Our larynx can move up and down easily. And the largest cartilage of that structure, this is the front, this is the thyroid cartilage. And this point right here at the lower part of the little shield, um, the V structure there, that's the pointy bit that in bodies that are significantly affected by the hormone testosterone are often seen visibly. And this is the side view of where that point would be. So we're looking at the front here. So that's our thyroid cartilage. Below that is the cricoid cartilage. And that's in the shape of a signet ring with the thin part in the front and the thick part in the back. And below that are the cartilage rings of our trachea. Our trachea is our windpipe that leads to our lungs. 
two other cartilages I want to point out to you that are very important. One is the epiglottis, which is a big leaf-shaped cartilage that folds over, and when it folds, it covers up our larynx completely so that we can swallow things and get them down into our esophagus instead of our trachea. And we'll look at the action of the esophagus in a second. I mean, the epiglottis, goodness. And then finally, I wanna point out this little cartilage here, and there's two of these. They're both in the back, but one on either side. And these are the arytenoid cartilages. And you should all like repeat after me at home, arytenoid cartilage, because they're fun to say. And this little pyramidal shaped cartilage uh, pivots in and out in, and helps these little tiny vocal folds that live right here, helps them open and close. So these little tiny vocal folds that come out from the side of our larynx and meet in the middle, did I mention they're very, very tiny? They're tiny, but they are mighty because they make some big sound, these little teeny tiny vocal folds. If you were to take them out and lay them on top of a coin, they would be about the size of a dime or a nickel in larger bodies, maybe up to the size of a quarter. So really small little things that are vibrating to make lots of sound. And those little tiny pieces of muscle and ligament vibrate very, very fast. When I sing A440, my vocal folds are oscillating 440 times per second, which is way too fast for the naked eye to see. And even the lowest, low, 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 like Russian basses have been clocked in, I don't know, that's not the right word, at like 67 oscillations per second, which is really low, still too fast for the naked eye to see. When the vocal folds come together, when they're touching, we say they're adducted. When they're open, we say abducted. And we'll look at what they look like from above so you get the idea of what I'm talking about here. Okay, here on the left, we have our vocal folds in an open position. So this is what they would look like as we breathe. And this on the right side is what they would look like when we're speaking or singing, when we're phonating and the vocal folds have come together to vibrate. Um, here we have the epiglottis. Here we have the root of the tongue. You can see into the trachea, this beautiful gray thing is the edge of our vocal folds and they really do look gray as you'll see shortly. Our arytenoid cartilages would be right here. And then back here you would see the esophagus if that picture were to expand a little bit. Uh, okay, I'm gonna show you before we move on and look at vocal folds in action, which we're gonna do in a second, I just wanna clear up the function of the epiglottis. So this is a person swallowing, and it's not super anatomically accurate, but it's good enough for our purposes. This is the epiglottis. And you see it folds over the top of the trachea. This is right where our larynx would be, right here. It's gonna fold over the trachea and let that green gunge go down our esophagus into our stomach. We cannot swallow stuff into our larynx. If we did, we would cough and choke, and that's exactly what happens when we get something down the wrong pipe or down the wrong tube. So just keep that in mind when you think about, oh, I feel dry, I want to hydrate my instrument. You take a sip of water, you're hydrating your mouth, you're hydrating your pharynx, you're hydrating your esophagus, but you're not really hydrating your larynx. And maybe that seems obvious to most of you, but I know for a while I thought I could take a sip of water and it would moisten my vocal folds. But actually the only way we can do that topically is through inhalation. So if you inhale steam or use a nebulizer that might topically hydrate your vocal folds, although the, the jury's still out on that research. Okay, now this is my favorite part. I'm gonna show you some gross slimy body parts. So if you're somebody who is very sensitive to that, which I totally honor, you are welcome to avert thine eyes for a few minutes. I'm going to show you some vocal folds in action. This is a young woman. Um, she is being scoped with, a, um, this is called stroboscopy. So she's in a laryngologist's office and the laryngologist had put a little camera through her nose and goes back through the sinus and it, they put it in far enough so that it can dangle down behind your uvula, behind your soft palate, so that we can view the larynx from above. So I'm gonna to go to that slide now. 
Here it is. So notice the epiglottis. Here's the arytenoid cartilages. Here's our beautiful gray colored vocal folds. Our esophagus would be up here and you'll be able to see the trachea through here. Now, while you watch, notice how the arytenoid cartilages move back and forth and bring the vocal folds together. And notice what happens when the singer goes high and when the singer goes low. And again. Once more. Try a real high pitch. Now give me a singing. At a low pitch and then sing up. Okay, can you go any further? Okay, good. And now high to low. all of you noticed that when the singer sang higher pitches the vocal folds lengthened and thinned and when she sang lower pitches the vocal folds got um, shorter and thickened and we're going to talk about how that happens in a moment you might have also noticed an interesting vibratory pattern remember our naked eye is not capable of seeing the actual vibratory pattern so you're just seeing parts of that um, vibration happen which can be tricky when we watch that in a stroboscopy. So I want to show you a cross section of the vocal folds and this little animation here is showing us the pattern of the vibration. So everybody bring your hands together. The palms of your hands are the insides of the vocal folds that come out to touch one another and what happens is the air comes up from the lungs below and first opens the bottom of the vocal fold and as the air comes up the vocal fold gradually opens until the top also opens and the bottom comes together. And it's this sort of wave-like action that is happening while we phonate, while we speak or while we sing. The layers of the vocal fold, the red part here is the muscle tissue and that's the thyroarytenoid muscle. It's connected between the thyroid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilages. That is the part of the vocal fold that contracts and can control that short, thick aspect of the vocal fold. And then the yellow part we see is the ligament structure. And then the outer layer, and I'm oversimplifying here, there's way more parts, but we're going to simplify. The gold part is the lamina propria and the epithelium, which you can basically think about as the mucosal layer. There's a very sort of jelly-like layer on the outside of our vocal folds that's always there and needs to be there for them to operate properly. So that's why systemic hydration is very important for singers. When we have those thicker, shorter vocal folds like you saw in the video, we generally associate that kind of sound with a chest voice or a modal voice or speaking voice or belt quality. And um, that's when more surface area is touching in that vibratory pattern. Whereas when we get a thinner vocal fold, and there's less surface area touching in that vibratory pattern, we hear something that we might call a head voice or falsetto or whooping or mode two, depending on what terminology you're familiar with. The last form of phonation that we could talk about is vocal fry, which is sort of noisy. It doesn't sound like a clear tone like the other types of, of registration do. And that's because the vibratory pattern is sort of irregular. It's no longer that beautiful rolling motion. Okay, now how do, how do we control that lengthening and thinning and that shortening and thickening? Let's look at the muscles involved for that. We talked about the thyroarytenoid muscle that is part of the vocal fold itself that connects from the thyroid cartilage to the arytenoid cartilage and when it contracts it makes the vocal fold shorter so that's what thickens and shortens the muscles that lengthen and thin the vocal folds are actually outside of the larynx these are the cricothyroid muscles and they connect the thyroid cartilage to the cricoid cartilage there's two of these on each side of the larynx and when they contract they tilt 
that thyroid cartilage forward, which has the effect of lengthening the vocal folds. And I think my friend Claudia Friedlander, who is one of the references I listed on your PDF handout, she says it the most succinctly of anyone I've ever heard. The combined activity of the thyroarytenoid and the cricothyroid muscles varies the length and thickness of the vocal folds, which modulates pitch and registration. And by registration, we're referring to that head voice, chest voice, mixed voice kind of difference. And this would be another great place for me to pause and take some questions if there are any questions. We do have a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, my goodness, I'm learning so much. <laughs> I've, I've been singing professionally for 21, 22 years and half of the stuff is all brand new to me. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, we have uh, two particular questions. One is how do lymph nodes fit into these diagrams? And what happens when your lymph nodes are swollen? That is a really great question and a question I've never been asked. Uh, the, the short answer is I have no idea. And that's something I'll have to look into. I don't know how the lymph nodes would directly affect specific extrinsic or intrinsic muscles of your larynx, but I bet they do when they're swollen. <laughs> so um, thank you for that question. I'm gonna go do a little research on that. And uh, who asked that question, in fact, um, afterward, if you wanna email me directly uh, to gary at emeraldensemble.org, then we'll be sure to hold Holly to her promise <laughs> and, uh, and, and get a direct answer to you. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. Um, another question regarding vocal fry. Is it actually detrimental, you know, physically harmful to your voice, or is that just, as the attendee asks, is that just sexism? Okay, so the, the, the short answer is it depends. Um, the, the other short answer is not really. Um, lots of people use vocal fry in their regular everyday speech patterns. It can be detrimental if you are pressing in such a way as to not provide an adequate airflow and pressure through your vocal folds for them to work optimally. So those muscles can start to become a little tense. You might end up with some muscle tension dysphonia in that situation. Um, so they can, it can be detrimental if it's a habitual pattern um, in which your muscles are not operating in a efficient functional manner. So that's how it can be detrimental. Now, it's not always detrimental. In fact, sometimes it's very useful. And I'm not only talking about death metal singers who use it all the time in order to keep their voices healthy and let amplification do the job. And I can explain that in another session someday if there's interest about it. But, but vocal fry is actually used by a lot of singers and is recognized more and more widely as a great cooling down tool, especially for singers who've been singing really, really high and stretching your vocal folds long for a long time. And, and building tension inside the muscle. If you, if you imagine, if you're a marathon runner, when you get finished with a marathon, your muscles really need some shaking out and some maybe massage because they've built up all this lactic acid from the long exertion. That can happen in your vocal folds too. And vocal fry, because of that irregular pattern of the vibration, can be a tool to move around that lactic acid in the overused muscles. And so some people do use it as a cool down activity. Thank you. We already have a request on the side here for, for, for you to give a death metal singing webinar. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, we have a question that's, that's timely and also applies to the aging voice. Um, uh, a question specifically reads as follows. I recently heard with respect to COVID that older people are more prone to having food or liquid go down the wrong pipe mm. because their muscles relax over time, I assume over the, the aging process. Uh, is that accurately? Uh, is this just anecdotal? Gosh, that's okay. That's a piece of information that I had not heard yet, but I'm glad to know about it. Um, I would, I can see how that might happen. Um, with aging, all of our soft tissues start to harden and our ligaments start to ossify. And so with all of the cartilage and ligament tissue in the larynx that's controlling those functions, I could see how a more um, mature 
body might have more trouble with those fine movements and control of the epiglottis in swallowing and, and things like that. Um, let me also take this moment to plug a brand new book that just came out this year, which is um, Singing Through Change. And the authors are Nancy Boss, who's a local to the Pacific Northwest. She just lives up in Paulsbo. Um, Kate Fraser Neely, a wonderful vocal pedagogue, and Joanne Bozeman, another wonderful vocal pedagogue. Some might know her also because she's the wife of Ken Bozeman, who's a famous vocal acoustician. Um, Singing Through Change, book just came out. It's all about the female voice um, through all the hormonal changes of midlife and beyond. And so there's, there's a lot of interesting information in that book. I haven't had a chance to really absorb it all yet. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I should add that probably also either the third or fourth session of the, the Emerald Coral Academy uh, will be devoted to the aging voice. So that, oh, that'll uh, be, uh, be particularly pertinent. Uh, I think at this point, let's, let's uh, just continue with the presentation. All right. So my next unit, the resonator, we're going to, this is going to be a shorter one because I have this wonderful video that's going to explain everything better than I ever could. But our resonator is the thing in which those sound waves that our vibratory source creates can bounce around, be boosted in various ways, and then fly through the air to our ears. So in our instrument, this is our vocal tract. And that includes all of the space above the larynx where those sound waves can bounce around before leaving our body. So that includes our pharynx or our throat, our mouth or our oral cavity, if we want to be fancy, our nasopharynx or our nasal cavity. And we can move these things around and change the shape, which makes our instruments so cool and unique because most instruments can't do that. So we can change the shape of our throat by activating our constrictor muscles in the throat and also by elevating or um, lowering our larynx because remember it's hanging from that hyoid bone which isn't directly attached to another bone so it can move up and down. We can change the shape of our mouth by moving our tongue, dropping our jaw, lifting our soft palate or velum and I'll show you that in just a minute. And then we can also open or close the access to our nasal cavity by manipulating our soft palate. Before I show you the little video that's going to be, that's going to explain how all these parts move and show you, I just want to point out there's a lot of what we call debauched kinesthesia associated with this part of our bodies. And debauched kinesthesia is a term that was coined by F.M. Alexander, the founder of the Alexander Technique, which probably many of you are familiar with. It has to do with the fact that oftentimes when we think we're doing one thing, we're actually doing a completely different thing. And an example of that would be, often when you ask someone to open their throat, because the only muscles they can activate in that pharynx structure are constrictor muscles, if they actively want to do something to open their throat, they constrict. So really, when it feels like you're opening your throat, you're actually closing your throat. Now, this doesn't happen in every single person, but this is a very common phenomenon. It's also this way with our soft palate. It's very hard to build reliable kinesthetic sense with our soft palate. It takes time. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're working with vocal tract things in your singing. So I'm going to show you. Come back. Come back, little control bar. Where are you? There you are. Okay. I'm going to show you this video. Tylee Ross is a, a very well-established singer. Um, he's been in a lot of national Broadway tours. He started, um, oh gosh, the East something opera company, the East Village. No, what was it called? It's a, 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 an opera company that really made a point of um, presenting pieces with um, really new and um, I, uh, different ideas of gender in in the piece. Gosh, I wish I could name, remember the name of that because it's really fun and you guys should check it out. Anyway, Tylee Ross is also a voice teacher and a vocologist and he made this excellent video of him singing inside of an MRI machine and he's going to point out all the parts we were just talking about. So I'm going to let him do the talking. <laughs> How about a raspberry? We 
weird, right? Want to see that on an ooh vowel? Ooh, ooh. Now, before I go any further, let's try to figure out what it is we're actually seeing here. Let's go back inside and see if we can identify some of the features of the vocal tract. Lips. Tongue. This difficult to control piece of anatomy is called the velum or the soft palate, but you can think of it as the nose gate. It opens and closes, controlling the flow of air and sound up into the nasal cavity. In most people, the velum is opening and closing constantly when we speak and sing, and we're barely even aware of it. Down here, we have the larynx, which houses the vocal folds. Okay, so hopefully that was clear. I know it went by kind of quickly. I'm happy to play any of that back for anyone if you'd like to see it again. Um, there are so many different ways we can move all these parts of our vocal tract and, and allow those sound waves to bounce around in different ways, which then affects the quality of our sound before it reaches the listeners. It's really something we could talk about for hours on end. So at this point, I'm going to... Um, rush through the rest of my presentation. There's not much left. And then uh, I'll take a few questions at the end. So if we're talking about complete vocal anatomy, we also have to talk about our articulators, which are primarily our tongue and our lips. And those are the parts that make vowels and consonants. And this separates us from all the other instruments, right? Because we can express words, we can express ideas and thoughts through these articulations. I'm not really going to talk much about that because I think there's going to be some diction covered in a future session. I will just point out that when we are making, so we all know that vowels are, we usually sing on the vowels, right? We, we want to do that a lot in our choirs. Uh, and when we're singing on a vowel, we're singing with an open vocal tract and we're phonating our, our vocal folds are vibrating. That's not always true of consonant sounds, right? We have voiced and unvoiced consonant sounds. So it's just interesting to realize that when we sing a voiced consonant, that is a consonant that we can put on pitch like mmm or zzzz or zzzz, all those voiced consonants, not only are we creating a point of friction that makes the consonant sound, but we are also vibrating our vocal folds and making pitch. So that's an important thing to realize. And of course, uh-oh, I lost my, there it is. Of course, we have a myriad shapes that we can manipulate in our mouth and in our vocal tract to make all these different vowel sounds that we sing on. And I would be amiss if I did not mention that all the body parts are important in the process of singing. And because there are so many cross-body relations between different parts, and our bodies really are one whole system, we should be thinking about overall alignment too in this, in this greater picture. So we are always moving when we sing. Singing is movement. Our whole body is involved. So there could be something happening in your foot that's directly affecting something in your throat. So it's worth thinking about whole body alignment as well, and that's something I may be able to address in a future section. And remember that all bodies are different. So your thoracic cavity range of motion might be completely different from your neighbor's range of motion, and your breathing might look a lot different from your neighbor's. It doesn't mean one is better than the other. There's no body type for singing. So I'll leave you with this thought by Richard Strauss, a composer I'm sure we've all experienced in one way or another. He was married to a soprano, so he knew the voice very well. And he says the human voice is the most perfect instrument, but the most difficult to play. And I posit that the reason it is the most difficult to play is because we can't see most of our instrument. And we can't understand always which part is doing what in order to address improvements as we're learning to sing. So I thank you for your time. At this point, I'm, I can take some final questions, if any have come, come along. You've been... We do, we do have one more, and it's a wonderful one, too. Okay. As well, ben. Uh, is vibrato controlled by the vibrator or the resonator mechanisms? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> so here's the thing about vibrato. 
Scientists still don't really know exactly what the process is that creates it. We've narrowed it down to a few muscles of the larynx. So it seems to be a process that involves the intrinsic or extrinsic muscles, or maybe both, of the larynx structure itself. So I think we can think about it more as a, a vibrator issue than a vocal tract issue, if that makes sense. But we don't have the exact formula yet. Isn't that mind blowing? It's like cats purring. My understanding is they, they don't actually know how a cat purrs. And, and I've, I've often equated, equated those two. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming in. So you can, uh, folks can type quickly. Uh, there are some thanks coming in. Do you mind turning off the screen share? Sure. Um, so, and I'll... Uh, there we go. Uh, if, if there are further questions, sorry, I'm, I'm manipulating my screen. I know you can't all see that. Um, to make sure that uh, if anything comes through, I'm, I'm catching it as most as possible. Um, and I will change my screen as well. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, there I can go. There I am. There am are. I there? <laughs> am I there among us? Uh, thank you very much, Holly. This was fantastic. Uh, if, if I weren't forcing everyone to be muted, I'm sure I would not be the only one applauding. Um, uh, thank you also to all of our participants for your questions and your contributions. Uh, again, you can help create more sessions of the Emerald Choral Academy by donating at emeraldensemble.org. The second session will, and this is the first announcement, the second session will take place on August the 11th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, Holly Boaz will present again. This time will be Vocal Anatomy 102, which will have a special focus on body alignment and breathing. Registration will be available for that in just a few days. Uh, later sessions will also consider topics like the aging voice and score markings and phonetics and diction. I hope you can join us for those. Uh, in the meantime, I am Gary Cannon, and on behalf of all the Emerald Ensemble, uh, thank you again, Holly, and uh, we wish you all uh, good physical, mental, and musical health. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Thanks very much.